Dr. Bluglaw Electronics. Got another Ask Smart question in my inbox today. This one comes from Kevin. He says, what is reforming slash forming capacitors and when and why should you do it? Uh, thanks, Kevin. Okay, why reform a capacitor? Well, first and foremost, many old capacitors may still be good. Um, they just don't hold up very well to sitting on a shelf. Uh, keep in mind that applies to new old stock capacitors as much as so, or even more so, than uh, capacitors inside of gear. I've had people before ask me, hey, I found these new old stock capacitors. They've never been used. You know, could you put them in my gear? And I'm, I'm kind of scratching my head sometimes saying, you do realize those 30-year-old new old stocks are just as bad as the 30-year-olds that were in your gear. And by the way, the ones in your gear may have been used 15 years ago, so they may even be in better shape than those 30-year-old new old stock. Second reason is some old values are kind of hard to find or hard to replace, um, especially in the same size container. And uh, certainly when you're trying to maintain the same looks, uh, the same aesthetics, in other words, keeping the amplifier looking all original. And the third reason might be is, hey, I'm not trying to put a whole lot of money in this thing. If the capacitors here could be reformed, and last for a few more years, then I'd rather do that than spend a ton of money replacing all the capacitors. And last and uh, not least down here, I made a little note. While reforming cans often does provide good results, and I should have said caps, but I said cans, I would put it secondary to replacing a capacitor. Um, if you're looking for long life, trying to, you know, if this is a 30-year-old radio, 40-year-old radio, and you're trying to extend its life another 40, 50 years, I'd replace the capacitors. If you're trying to get it up and running for another five years, maybe something like that, maybe 10, um, then try this reforming method. Okay, let's talk a little bit about what is an electrolytic capacitor. So this whole reforming process really only applies to electrolytics. I first learned about it in the uh, say mid to late 80s. I was in electrical engineering school and uh, we were powering up some old uh, vintage equipment that uh, the instructor had and he kind of taught us he said hey we may want to try reforming these caps a little before these we bring these up they haven't been used in quite a few years and uh, i kind of thought oh that sounds odd what is reforming capacitors so first you got to understand what an electrolytic capacitor is it is an electrochemical device similar to a battery uh, I've noted here they do dry out with age, and at some point they will reach a point they just cannot be reformed effectively. If you look over here on the left, you can see that typically you've got some kind of outer can uh, for a capacitor, which might be aluminum. You've got some kind of insulating sleeve. Then you've got a wound cell that is made up of um, some type of aluminum foil. That's typically the anode. Um, it's typically etched and covered with an aluminum oxide, a dielectric, and that dielectric is that chemical that typically uh, over time dries out. And then they kind of space these things uh, with uh, paper uh, that may be uh, impregnated with that electrolytic, and then they've got a cathode that's aluminum foil. And then they usually put this all inside of a can and seal it up with some type of rubber seal. And they've got some leads that protrude through for you to connect uh, the cathode and anode or positive and negative. As you can see down here, this is kind of a top sectional view of what this might look like. But you can see how you've got this, uh, the positive plate here. Then you've got this aluminum oxide layer. Then you kind of got the uh, negative plate here, the cathode. Uh, and this is all wrapped up and contained internally, and then you connect a lead here and a lead here. What happens with these devices is as that electrochemical uh, ma uh, material, the, uh, the aluminum oxide, it, the aluminum oxide starts to break down over time and not uh, be as congruent or um, I would say as smooth and um, kind of... Uh, consistent as it once was across these uh, windings in the capacitor. And so 
heating these capacitors up without a load on them, and I say heating them up, bringing them up to voltage, um, you can actually reform um, that aluminum oxide layer in there. It, it's kind of a reverse chemical uh, effect that takes place, and it's above my level of, uh, of uh, chemical knowledge here to explain why to you. But if done slowly and over time without a big load onto it, you can actually reform these capacitors. That is, assuming that the electrolytic is not so dried up that it can't be reformed. And then I thought I'd show you over here on the right. This is just a typical can cap that we see in a lot of tube gear. And a lot of times these will have a little four-digit date code on them. Like this one was made the seventh week of 1979. A lot of the gear I'm working on, these things are made in the 60s. Um, well, now some of these things are getting up to be 40, 50 years old. And uh, so they might just need to be replaced. But um, hey, it's worth a try. You have nothing to lose by try, trying to reform, especially the methods I'm going to show you. Okay, before I dive into reforming, I thought I'd show you a few other options. One would be to buy new cans designed to fit your gear. So if you're working on an old Fisher piece of gear or Scott or Ico or whatever, there's some companies that make multi-section can caps these days. Um, the CE of Manufacturing, you can get those from uh, Antique Electronics Supply. Hayseed Hamfest makes a lot of custom uh, ones for you. And then uh, C-Tech, uh, an eBay seller, carries a wide variety of different types. As you can see down here, some of these are the firecracker types. Uh, some of those guys carry those as well. Uh, method number two, you could cut your cap off your uh, can here and uh, kind of restuff these things. Um, I've done this before. You put a couple smaller capacitors inside of this, wire it up, uh, put the top back on. If you decide to go that route, there's some videos and uh, instructions out online for you. Or you could just replace the capacitor underneath with a, uh, some caps under the chassis, which I, I do a lot of. It depends on how much uh, the owner is wanting to invest and how much uh, they're wanting to keep it all original. This was a um, Pilot uh, 202 um, amplifier and it had a firecracker um, capacitor right here. One end uh, connected here and then it had two other connections on the other end like this one down here. And I just replaced it with two equivalents in parallel here and heat shrinked everything up nice and neatly. And uh, good to go. Okay, before I dive into how to reform, I must tell you reforming a capacitor involves high voltages that can be lethal. If you're not comfortable around high voltages and have some basic electronics understandings, please do not attempt this alone. I cannot be held liable for what may happen. I just need to give you that warning. Okay, first step in looking at reforming a capacitor is you want to do a physical inspection of the capacitor because if it's leaking, bulging, disformed, um, then you're not going to want to attempt the, uh, the reform because the electrolytic is uh, breaking down to the point it's leaking out of the capacitor. And here's some telltale signs. You can see these capacitors here that are bulging on top. You can see these are actually leaking. These are some old... Uh, you know, axial type, and you can see this one's bulging here. You can see this one's actually leaking out of the bulge. Similarly, you can see this one leaking out of the bulge. It's a high voltage capacitor here. You can see it's starting to leak a little bit down here on the end. These are starting to ooze out black stuff. If you find any of that, uh, replace the capacitors. All right, but if reforming something you still want to undergo, then follow one of these three possible methods I'll tell you about. I am going to upload this to my website at blueglow.net under my info and sketches section um, so you don't have to take all these notes down. Uh, you can download a PDF that will be up there. The first method I'm going to call is a high voltage capacitor tester and I'm going to call that the best method. So you're going to need a couple things. You'll need to remove the capacitors from the circuit or if you need want to leave them mounted in the chassis that's fine. You're just going to have to disconnect the things connected to the capacitors. Um, you're going to need some type of high voltage capacitor tester capable of going up to 400 volts or so. A couple of good examples, the Sprague Telomic, uh, there's a couple of versions of that, the Heat Kit C3. There's others, there's Ico, uh, Peco, etc. You just want something that will go up to four to 600 volts. 
and you're going to want it to be able to be variable. Hopefully it'll have a uh, current meter on it, but if not, we can show you how to handle that. And you're probably going to want a digital ESR meter as well. First thing you're going to do is connect the capacitor to the tester, uh, positive to positive, negative to negative. Slowly raise the voltage on the capacitor up to around 100 volts. Um, or the maximum volt working voltage on the capacitor. In other words, if you're trying to reform a 63 volt capacitor, do not take it to 100 volts. But if you're trying to reform a 400 volt capacitor, take it up to 100 volts. Let it sit a while, about an hour. Um, because if, if for whatever reason that thing is, um, you know, not formed so well inside, you're not wanting to apply all this voltage at once. You're wanting to let it kind of slowly uh, build up a little bit of... Uh, heat and voltage in there to uh, kind of start reforming this thing. Then raise the voltage another 100 volts, um, there again, or the max working voltage. Let it sit a while, an hour or so. Continue this 100 volts at a time until you reach the maximum working volt on the capacitor and stop there. At that point, I like to let it sit overnight at that point. Watch the meter on your tester if it has one. If not, then uh, go to method two, there'll be some ways to explain it, but you can still use your capacitor tester. You're just going to have to put a thing or two in series to help measure the, um, the current. Um, so watch this. Make sure that it settles down below 50 microamps or less of leakage current. Hopefully down around 10 microamps or less. Um, maybe two or three or four microamps. You'll never get it completely gone. Um, if your leakage goes below 50 microamps, then take it out and test it on an ESR meter. If you get a decent equivalent series resistance value out of this thing, then you're likely good to go. I made a note here. If the capacitor is 100 mi 10,000 microfarad or more, maybe 68,000, 76,000, 10,000, um, 10, sometimes you may have to move up into a little bit higher range. Uh, 80 to 100 microamps would be acceptable with a capacitor of that size. I'm saying here, if you can't get it below those acceptable ranges, replace the capacitor. Uh, make sure you discharge this capacitor. Never do that with a dead short. Use a 100 ohm resistor or more. Uh, anything, 330K, 500 ohm, 150 ohm, whatever you got laying around um, across the two leads uh, and let it uh, sit there for a few seconds to kind of discharge and then put it back in circuit or reconnect the wires if all that went well. All right. This one I'm calling the second best method um, using a half voltage power supply. Um, not a lot different than before. You're just going to, instead of having a capacitor tester to generate that high voltage, you're going to use a high voltage power supply capable of going up to the level of the capacitor rating. Uh, example, a Heathkit IP17. I use one of those on my bench a lot. It goes up to about 400 volts. Um, Spellman, Flute, B and K, many others make these things. Um, I will tell you, if it's a newer digital um, based capacitor tester, it will not put out high voltage. You're going to need an old tube based um, high voltage power supply, probably something made uh, 30, 40 years ago. You're going to need a multimeter, and I would recommend an analog one. And the reason being, um, if you use a digital one, it just shuts off uh, quite regularly. So, because uh, they're typically trained to do so, which means every hour when you're rechecking on these things, you're going to have to turn it back on. But that's not that big a deal. You're going to need 150 to about 470K ohm resistor, 2 watt or more. I would prefer the 470K if I was doing it. And um, you still, again, you still want a digital ESR meter. Connect the power supply to the capacitor like you see over here in this picture. So the positive to the positive of the power supply. Then you're going to bring the negative back through the 470K ohm resistor. And you're going to put a voltmeter across that 470K ohm resistor. And you're going to slowly raise the voltage on the power supply, same as before, to 100. Let it sit a while. Raise it another 100. Let it sit a while. Continue this until you reach the maximum working voltage on the cap. And there again, I like to let it sit overnight. By the way, if at any point during this, these steps you're drawing a ton of current, the capacitor is getting hot, anything of that nature, stop and uh, toss the capacitor and replace it. Um, and then similarly here, what you want to watch this time is the meter across the resistor. Um, so if you're trying to measure this, 
you'd have about 22 volts across the 470 ohm resistor. Should give you around 50 microamps of leakage current. Uh, if you want to use something besides a 470 ohm resistor, then you just have to use Ohm's law to kind of figure out what voltage would equal what current. Um, so if your leakage current's below 50 microamps or about 22 volts, um, then then you're probably good to go here. Uh, if not, replace the capacitor. I would definitely discharge it. Um, and there again, you can test it on an ESR meter as well. And put it back in circuit and connect it up to go. Okay, the third method is an in-circuit method using a power the power supply of the device. It's my least preferred method, and I'm not going to recommend it to you. Here's why. There are a lot of different power supply designs at play. Um, and so I could tell you how to do this in a lot of cases, but then there would be a case where that doesn't work out so well, and you end up frying something in your piece of equipment, and you're going to come back to me and say, Mark, but you told me to do it that way. And what, so I'm just not going to take the risk with that. Um, so you will need, if you want to go this route, research various methods listed on the Internet. Just Google capacitor reforming. and You'll find several different methods for this, doing it in the actual amplifier or receiver or whatever the device is you're trying to reform capacitors in. Um, so why I'm not recommending it, many power supply designs at play much more associated risk to the overall unit. Many in steps involve removing tube rectifiers and replacing those with a diode equivalent. Others involve pulling tubes and or wiring in current limiting resistors into your filament or cathode circuits, which I'm not a big fan of. Because then I'm having to teach you how to do all of that just to be able to reform a capacitor. I think you're better off to unsolder the wires to the capacitor and use one of the methods I've shown you before. Uh, and there's also risk to your power supply transformer. If a capacitor shorts or has super heavy leakage, you could end up burning up your power supply transformer, and you would not want that. So if you want to go this path, there's some other guys out there that will tell you how to do it. I'm not recommending it, and I'm not going to show you, show you how to, because I think there's just too much risk to your gear to uh, go down that path because of all the different uh, varieties of power supply, um, I would say, uh, schematics and designs out there. Okay, Kevin, I hope you and whoever else is interested in uh, this topic has learned something today, and, um, you know, just the whole why do it. Hey, it might be a good cheap route to get a device up and running effectively. And, uh, you know, that's kind of when you might would do it. Uh, when you shouldn't is when you're trying to... Uh, make something last another 30, 40 years, because these things, uh, like we said, electrochemical devices, they do dry out. It's just like having a battery on a shelf for 30, 40 years. Sooner or later, uh, they kind of dry out and uh, are useless. So thanks for watching, everybody. Stay tuned. we got more Ask Mark questions coming.